Hi folks, welcome to the beginning of chapter 16, nuclear physics. Now, to be able to do nuclear physics, what we really have to understand is what's going on inside the nucleus. So this whole first section is all about trying to figure out um, the characteristics of what's inside the nucleus. If we're kind of going back to the previous chapter, what we're really kind of focusing in on is what Rutherford had discovered, essentially, although he didn't get all of it necessarily done in the way we were talking about it there. But this idea of there has to be something in the core, the center of every atom that is, first of all, a whole bunch of positive charges all kind of jammed really close together um, that gives the alpha particle something to go in towards to get bounced off of. But maybe there's other stuff going on in there as well. And so that's what this whole section is about. So. To begin with, and if you do want to look at this video later on your own, you can certainly do that. We have to talk about um, sort of the difference between what we're doing right now and maybe some of the biases that you're bringing from having also been in chemistry classes. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with being in those chemistry classes, but we're going to be looking at something different. We're going to be focusing on different things. So if you're in a chemistry class, really, what you got to focus on is what are the electrons doing? Because they're whizzing around outside, but they're the, the part that you focus on in chemistry because, you know, Leo says Ger, you've got um, <clears throat> electrons being um, dropped off and, and you form a positive ion like a metal or you're gaining electrons uh, if you're a non-metal and you can explain bonding that way. That's, that's what the chemistry folks need to focus on. For us, we're going into the nucleus. We're doing nuclear physics, nucleus, nuclear. And so what we're looking at is all the stuff that's inside the nucleus. Now, that'll still be important to a chemistry person because the number of protons that are in that nucleus, that determines the element. And then the chemistry folks might not care about it quite so much, but we have to focus on that entirely. What are those protons doing in there? And is there anything else hanging out with them? Because what we're really talking about are the nucleons. Nucleon is just the generic term that refers to anything we find in the nucleus. Now I'm betting that you already know what we find in the nucleus. Because sure, previous chapter, we really, really focus on Rutherford saying there are protons in the nucleus, but there is something else also, the neutrons. So protons and neutrons are our nucleons. They are the, the parts that we got to think of together as forming what the nucleons are. So what are their properties? Well, for protons, um, we can use the symbol lowercase p with a superscript plus sign like that. That's to separate it in our brains from just like a p on its own that would mean momentum. Um, we know that they have a positive charge. In fact, significantly, they have a positive elementary charge. This isn't E for electron. This is E for elementary charge, and I'm telling you it's a positive elementary charge. So positive 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. We do know their mass. Now, one thing I am doing here, if you look at your data sheet, is I'm giving you some extra sig digs. This will become a little bit important shortly. It'll become a lot important later in later sections. But for now, uh, 1.67-ish times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms, which makes them orders of magnitude heavier than electrons. No big surprise there. And the part that a chemist would at least start to listen to us about, but then we change things up a little bit, is that the number of protons in the nucleus is what determines the element. So that's like just written in stone rule. The number of protons determines which element we're dealing with. A chemist will say, sure, that's the atomic number, the number that you can easily see on any periodic table. But for us in physics, we do give it a bit of an extra name of sorts. We call it the Z value. We'll say, what is the Z value of what you're uh, looking at for whatever element you're talking about. Now, along with all this stuff about protons, we can talk about the happy neutrons. 
Now, the same sort of things that we talk about here, we can say similar things, we can measure similar things about our neutrons. So first of all, symbol, it's going to be an N with a zero, a not symbol, superscript up in the right. Remember, these are all things we, we got to make sure that we're writing these consistently the same way. For its charge, it doesn't have a charge. That's the whole thing about neutrons is that they don't have a charge. What about their mass? Hmm. Mass of a proton, 1.6726 times 10 to the negative 27. 1.6749. Okay, now this is part that sometimes kind of, I don't want to say surprises, but people go, huh, because you've been probably told a whole bunch, protons and neutrons have the same mass. And even the way they're written on our data sheet with only three sig digs, they have the same mass. But what we're seeing here is the significance of, no they don't, not exactly. We do have to go a few more decimal places in. We're going to do something with that later. That's going to mean something to us in a later section. And then there's the number of neutrons. The number of neutrons is important to us. It might not be a big hairy deal to you know somebody in, in chemistry because they're not going to really do much with it necessarily. But for us, we do need to know the neutron number, how many neutrons there are, and we give it its own symbol, N, capital N. So how do we kind of link that together of how many protons we've got and how many neutrons we've got? Well, we can talk about the atomic mass number, capital A. Capital A, the atomic mass number, is us saying how many protons have I got, how many neutrons have I got in that nucleus, and let's add them together. And when we add them together, we get the atomic mass number. Now this is reflected somewhat on our periodic tables, um, but it's a number with a decimal. And you might have been told generic stuff in previous courses about rounding that number off to its nearest whole number and, and all that stuff. We're, we're going to get a bit more into that in detail shortly, but what I can tell you for now is that just for what we're doing in the moment, we are going to talk about very specific isotopes, if you have heard that word before, and we're going to talk about them having not just obviously a specific number of protons, because that's the element we're dealing with, but a specific number of neutrons in the example we're doing, so we get the A value, the total number of everything that's in the nucleus. That's how I used to remember this, it's all of them, A, all of them, Z for the protons, capital N, number of neutrons. So. If I'm going to write stuff down in physics, I'm going to write the symbol from the periodic table because our friends in chemistry have given us a beautiful periodic table that IUPAC makes sure that everybody agrees on. So this is where the symbol of the element goes. And then we get the real estate on the left-hand side. Chemistry, right-hand side. Us, left-hand side. On the top, you're giving the A value. You're telling me all of the nucleons that are in that nucleus. The bottom number is the Z value, the number of protons. Now there is a bit of a catch here, not catch, but something we can get away with. Um, if you want to, although I wouldn't suggest it, especially when we're working out problems and stuff, it's actually considered acceptable to not put in the Z value. The reason being, if I've shown you the element, I'm always going to have a periodic table I can always go look at it for its atomic number, and that tells me what that is anyways. I do still need that though, because again with this isotopes thing we haven't talked about much yet, um, the number of nucleons, total number of nucleons can be different because we might be looking at an isotope with different numbers of neutrons. So I tell you that I have a particular nucleus that has seven protons, eight neutrons, and I want to know what element it is, and I want you to write it down using all the proper numbering and everything like that. So what I would be looking at is my Z value that I put at the bottom is 7. That's the number of protons it's got. 15? Where'd that come from? Oh yeah, that's right. This is the total number, so it's 7 plus 8. 
It's the total number of everything that I've got. So 7 is the number of protons, 15 is all the nucleons. Because it's got 7 protons, I look at my periodic table, I look for that atomic number, it is nitrogen. That's the only thing it can be because nitrogen always has 7 protons, 7 protons is always nitrogen. So that's what I've got. Now if I'm going to read this, if I was going to say to somebody, this is what I've got, I would read this as either nitrogen 15 or N15. Again, the idea being that I don't need to say this number because as soon as I've identified that it's nitrogen, it has to have seven protons. I look at the periodic table. That's just what nitrogen is. I do need to say this number though, the 15, because that's telling me which isotope I'm dealing with. Okay. Now if I've got something like this and I give it to you and I say, what does that mean? What is that telling us? There's a whole bunch of information I can look for. I can look at my periodic table and I can identify that the element is sodium. I also can see that just from reading the number, atomic number 11, the Z value being 11, I look for it on the periodic table, it has to be sodium. But because it is a 23 as its A value, all the nucleons, it is sodium 23. And I can take the 23 minus 11 and find out that there has to be 12 neutrons. Okay, So I get a whole bunch of information just from writing it that way in nuclear physics. And remember, our numbers have to appear to the left, superscript and subscript, have to be in those spots. So I've said this a few times now, isotope, isotope, isotope. The great thing for a chemist is it doesn't really matter most of the time which isotope you're dealing with because chemically they're going to basically do the same things. But for us in physics, there's a whole world of difference that happens. So because of that, we do need to understand what isotopes are. So looking at the example of carbon, why carbon? Well, it's really common. There's carbon everywhere. Okay, uh, Anything that's basically a plant that's growing, mostly made out of carbon. So what I've got listed here are four different isotopes of carbon. Carbon 11, carbon 12, carbon 13, carbon 14. Notice that all of them have the same Z value, 6, because they're all carbon, and carbon always has 6 protons. But this number is different because although they all have 6 protons, they have different numbers of neutrons. 11 minus 6 tells me that there has to be 5 neutrons. Now this thing I've got down here, natural abundance, trace, Natural abundance, think of it as being how commonly do we find it. So if I've got a big old sample of carbon atoms and I start counting them out and separating them into their different isotopes, how many of them would be carbon 11? Not very many. Trace just means like such a small percentage that you'd have to start looking up for some pretty specific numbers, a whole bunch of sig digs uh, or uh, decimal places in to get that number. So it means that I probably wouldn't find very many carbon 11s. But what about carbon 12 where it has to have 6 protons because that's what it has. 12 minus 6 is 6 neutrons. Oh wow, 98.93 percent. That means if I start counting out my carbon atoms, I'm going to find that carbon 12 accounts for by far the vast majority of them. I've just got piles and piles and piles of carbon-12 atoms then. I jump up to carbon-13 where again, although it has 6 protons, 13 minus 6, it has 7 neutrons, Oh, it's about 1%. And if you do look at these numbers, I know when you add them together it comes out as exactly 100%. You have to remember that even in these digits here, we've rounded off a bit. It's not exactly 100%. So having trace amounts here and carbon-14 trace amounts again, yeah, and even other isotopes, those are all possible. 
Okay, they're all happening. It's just very rarely. Now, one question that's worth kind of asking is if I'm, I'm looking at, for example, carbon isotopes, and I said, um, what is the carbon isotope that would be the smallest, like when I'm saying the numbers, uh, carbon 11, carbon 12, carbon 13, what's the smallest I can go down to? Well, it would actually have to be carbon 6. And if you think about it, what that would mean is it would be 6 and 6 written there. 6 minus 6 is 0. That would be 0 neutrons. Now I can tell you that would be highly unstable. Uh, chances of finding that, oh, just so tiny, it's crazy, because it would be a highly unstable nucleus. Neutrons in the nucleus, we're going to find, add stability to them. So that would be kind of bonkers. It's, we're just not going to find that. It's like getting a package shipped to you from Amazon, and they didn't stuff in a whole bunch of packing material. You just expect it. That's what the neutrons are. Now, how high can we go? Well, theoretically, really high. But again, that would be, and I guess maybe Amazon does do this sometimes, but getting a package where there's something small inside and just all filled with packing material. Um, there comes a point where adding more neutrons, extra packing material, just isn't worth it. Okay, So we do kind of hit limits of reasonably what can happen. So basically, talking about the nucleus, one thing that we should discuss is how can the nucleus actually stay stuck together? The reason I point this out is because if I've got a whole bunch of protons, don't worry so much about the neutrons right now, but if I've got a whole bunch of protons near each other in the nucleus, they should want to fly apart from each other. The electrostatic force that close together at the scale of a nucleus must be enormous. So why don't they? And this is exactly what physicists were asking around the time of Rutherford, because if he's saying that's what a nucleus is, how could all those positive charges stay so uh, closely packed together? Well, one of the questions we could, or the suggestions we could have is, maybe it's the gravitational force. Maybe Fg is pulling them together. Now, I don't like that idea, because one of the things we've talked about in the past is that the force of gravity compared to things like electrostatic force and magnetic force is wimpy, like really wimpy. So that shouldn't be true, but we should test it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a ratio, Fe over Fg, if, and this is the if, uh, there is some sort of equilibrium where the electrostatic force pushing the protons apart and the gravitational force pulling them together is in equilibrium, F net equals zero, then these should essentially be at least very, very close to the same number. That means that when I take these two and divide them, I should basically get one because same amount of repulsion with same amount of attraction, same number over same number, it should equal one. And I mean like pretty much exactly one. So what can we put in for formulas? For Fe, I've got Coulomb's law, kqq over r squared. For Fg, I've got universal law of gravitation, gmm over r squared. Now that's a whole bunch of stuff. And like, wow, what are we going to do? We're going to cancel some stuff out. Because in both the top and the bottom, I've got r squared. I can actually cancel that out. And that's handy because even if I don't know in the nucleus, on average, how far apart the protons are from each other, I don't need to. They're canceling anyways. So it becomes this. And this is stuff that I can put numbers in. Uh, I know Coulomb's constant. I know the charge on protons, and it just happens to be two protons. I'm basically saying, you know, next to each other, what are they doing in the nucleus? Gravitational constant, the mass of two protons near each other. Wowzers. Just a whole bunch of numbers. Everything on here, though, is stuff from your data sheet. So I throw that all into my calculator, and I get this over this. 
oh, I'm already a little bit worried. 1.24 times 10 to the 36. What that really means is at the, you know, stuff that's happening inside the nucleus, the electrostatic force is 1.24 times 10 to the 36 times bigger than the gravitational force. Yeah, FG is not holding things together. So what are physicists going to do? Well, sometimes when we're faced with something this crazy, this um, pushes us in directions to say there's got to be something we didn't think of before. So it sounds kind of weird, but we invented a force. Well, not invented, but we said there has to be something that we haven't talked about before that is happening. The strong nuclear force. It's called that because, well, first of all, it's strong. It's got to be powerful because it's got to overcome, or balance, I should say, the electrostatic repulsion between those protons. And it is a nuclear force. It happens only on the scale of the nucleus. So there's no strong nuclear force between me and my desk because we're not nucleus scale sized. It's only in the nucleus and really only like protons right next to other protons that experience the strong nuclear force of attraction. If we've got protons on opposite sides of the nucleus, they don't actually affect each other by the strong nuclear force because that's too far apart. So it's almost like this web that forms between protons inside the nucleus. So that brings us to this crazy idea where I'm basically saying, oh look, I've got some neutrons and some protons inside a nucleus. And they're just all kind of jiggling around in there a little bit, right? Because they must have some energy, so they'd be moving a little bit. But right now, right now at this point, they're in the nucleus, they are stable. And I can count these out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven protons. It's nitrogen. And it's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven neutrons. So it's nitrogen 14. Because seven plus seven is 14. So this is a, a stable nucleus. There's nothing too crazy about this. Um, and that's all it is. But what I want us to consider is comparing this, a stable nitrogen nucleus, to what it's like when they're all just kind of loosey-goosey. And what I mean by that is I, I've still got seven protons and seven neutrons here, but they're not in a nucleus anymore. They're just freely bopping around. I, I don't know why they're kind of still closest to each other, but they're just there but they're not a nucleus. They're not the nucleus of a nitrogen um, atom anymore. They're just, they're just floating around. Now, the question we have to ask ourselves is, how do we get from this to this? A stable nucleus where they're together to a bunch of just freely moving around individual neutrons and protons. Well, the simple answer is, We got to hit it. We got to pound it with energy. Because if I hit this with additional energy, I'm going to break it apart. Because all that extra energy, it's going to make them whiz around so much that they separate from each other and they become this. So, what that essentially tells me is the nucleus has less energy because I had to hit it and add energy to make them become individual nucleons. This is less energy. This is more energy. Hmm. There was somebody that told us something kind of important about energy. Good old Einstein, E equals mc squared, which basically says that energy is mass. Mass is energy. They're kind of interchangeable. Sure, we got to take mass times the speed of light squared to get the energy, but Energy and mass are interchangeable ideas to us in physics. Okay, so over here I'm saying less energy, more energy. Scratch out the word energy. Put in the word mass. Hey, wait a second. 
less mass, more mass. But that's got to be crazy because here I have seven protons and seven neutrons. Here I have seven protons and seven neutrons. It's the same stuff. But when they're organized in a stable nucleus, they have less mass. And when they're separate, they have more mass. This doesn't make sense because you're used to like chemistry where you have conservation of mass and, and that's just the rule and that's great and everything. This is bonkers. This is me saying I have seven green and seven red Lego pieces and I build something and I put it on a scale and I measure how heavy it is. And then I break apart the Lego pieces so they're separate and I put all the pieces on the scale. And now they're heavier when they're separate. Okay, that's, that's bonkers sounding. But that's because we have to, in physics, at this nuclear level especially, we have to recognize that energy and mass are equivalent to each other. They're interchangeable. And that to get from here to here, I had to add energy, which means I added mass. And that can't, that can't just disappear. It becomes heavier. These pieces are heavier than when they were together. So what do we do with this? Well, we can make statements like this. The mass of the nucleus is less than, and just in case you haven't seen this before, uh, it's a math thing. It's the Greek letter sigma, and it means sum of. So sum total, like add them together. The sum total of the masses of all the protons plus the sum total of the mass of all of the neutrons. Add those together when they're individual pieces. They are heavier than the mass of the nucleus. We already said that. But we came up with a name for the difference between these two sides. We call it the mass defect, delta M. Now, defect makes it sound like something's broken. That, uh, that it's defective or something. No, in this case, it's just recognizing that we got something weird going on here that's kind of unexpected, a difference in mass between the same things, only how we're organizing them changes stuff. So it kind of sounds crazy, but the difference between these is the mass defect. That means that when we start talking about Einstein's famous formula, we should actually have deltas in front of both of these because we're allowing mass to change, right? Because of the change in energy that we were doing. So because of this, and because this gets a special kind of name, mass defect, we give this a special name also. We call it the binding energy. And the idea here is that there has to be a difference between when the nucleus was held together, bound together, binding, and when they were free moving apart nu uh, nucleons, separate protons and neutrons just kind of floating around separate from each other. And that difference, that energy difference between binding them together and letting them fly around free is the mass defect. Okay, so it's kind of, kind of a linkage here that we've got. Now this brings us to measuring stuff about mass a little bit differently. And I'm sorry that we're throwing you know, another sort of non-metric unit at you, but when physicists were playing around with this stuff at a nuclear level, doing all of our measurements in kilograms, the numbers are just so tiny. And you know, we get all these times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms, and, and then doing the delta m's, those changes are even smaller. So they kind of came up with a, a system here, a way of trying to measure these changes and these masses with numbers that look a little bit more normal, atomic mass units, AMU, or even just U. That can be the way that you're writing it down. So they want to come up with a standard for this. The standard they picked was carbon-12. Why carbon-12? Well, again, what I already said to you is carbon is really common, and carbon-12 is 
most of the carbons I find. And because it's a, a clump of stuff, it's six protons and six neutrons, it's enough stuff that maybe we could do some decent measurements of it, and then we can use that for our standard for everything else. So they set the mass of carbon-12 at 12.000000, just keep writing zeros, atomic mass units. They said carbon-12 is the standard 12 atomic mass units, 12U, okay? So, what does that do for us? Well, it means that if I look at what an atomic mass unit means, it means one atomic mass unit is a twelfth of the mass of carbon-12. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Twelve pieces, carbon-12, one twelfth, one atomic mass unit. Yeah, this all connects together. It does mean that if we do a conversion into kilograms, we do get a number that's really close to the mass of a proton and a neutron, but it's not exactly the same as either. And when you look at your data sheet at the bottom of the list of constants, you'll see it listed as 1.66 times 10 to the negative 27. I'm giving you some extra sig digs here, and I like using this number for a lot of the stuff that we do, uh, but it does mean that if you're using the value from the data sheet, some of the numbers that I'm going to show eventually, they get shifted off a little bit different, okay? So either you're using the number from the data sheet because that's all you've got, or maybe on a question on an exam or the diploma or whatever, maybe we even give you a number like this with extra sig digs so you can be a bit more careful. But here's where things do get a little bit weird because what we have to recognize is that even though carbon-12 is made up of 12 pieces, 6 protons and 6 neutrons. In the act of breaking them apart, I have to add energy to do that. What do I do to them as individual pieces? I add mass. So when I break apart carbon-12 into its 6 protons and 6 neutrons as separate individual pieces, and I say, so what are their masses? they're bigger than one. Because once they're broken apart, they have to gain mass. Because the act of breaking them apart became their additional mass. So that's why when they're separate, the mass of a proton and a neutron is slightly heavier than one atomic mass unit. And although we don't use it very often at all, the mass of an electron in atomic mass units looks something like this we got to go a whole bunch of decimal places in to say anything about it. So this means we can do calculations based on information that we've got about a particular isotope maybe that we're looking at. So I chose to do an example with you for zirconium-93. Now one thing I have to caution you on here is I wanted to show you an example that has some extra stuff in it. So one of the things that I did that is very specific here is I said the atom has a mass of 92.90647 atomic mass units. It's significant that I say here it's the mass of the atom, because if it's the entire atom, it's not just the nucleus, that includes the electrons. Now the reason I'm giving you a caution here is because most of the time you won't be given the mass of the atom, they'll go straight to giving you the mass of the nucleus and then we get to ignore everything about the electrons because it's not even part of the problem. I wanted to show you how we could do it though if they did give us atom. So I'm going to actually first figure out the mass of the nucleus. Once we've got that, we're going to figure out its mass defect, and we're going to figure out its binding energy. Now for the purpose of doing this, we're going to need some of the numbers from the previous slides at some points. And also, we're going to kind of ignore sig digs. We're just going to write down numbers with as many digits as we basically are getting on our calculators. We don't usually do that, but it's okay-ish here. So, we should figure out what the characteristics are of zirconium-93 before we start trying to do anything else. When I look it up on the periodic table, zirconium is atomic number 40, 
So that's the number of protons. 93 is its A value, so that's all the nucleons. 93 minus 40, that would mean that there are 53 neutrons. And significant to us for this question, because we're assuming the zirconium is neutral, we've got no reason to think otherwise. If there's 40 protons, there's also 40 electrons. We're going to need these numbers. So, as I've already said, usually we can skip this part because usually they'll have given me the mass of the nucleus for starters, not the mass of the atom. This one's kind of special. But what I'm basically saying is, if I know the mass of the atom, right there, I, I was told that in the previous slide, I know that for regular neutral zirconium, there has to be 40 electrons whizzing around. So I'm going to subtract the mass of 40 electrons. I'm just going to say, get rid of them, don't consider them, because I want to look at just what the nucleus has. So this is the mass of my, uh, my uh, nucleus for zirconium that was on the previous slide, measured in atomic mass units, minus 40 mass of the electrons. And this again, a couple of slides back, was given to you. So I go through all of this, and I get the mass of my nucleus as being just a smidge smaller than the mass of the atom. But this is the number usually that you'll start with, that they'll give to you at the beginning. They'll say, the mass of the nucleus is. Okay, so this is usually the starting point. But in case you had to do this, this is what it would look like. Now, for the mass defect, what I got to be thinking of is, the nucleons, when they're separate, are heavier than when they're together in the nucleus. So my mass defect is going to be the mass of all the individual nucleons minus the mass of the nucleus. I just figured this out on the previous slide. What's this number? I'm going to do it as a separate calculation for you, just so you can see how I'm going to get this. I know that for my zirconium, there has to be 40 protons. I also know that in the nucleus, there has to be 53 neutrons. 40 protons, 53 neutrons. If I take those as individual masses, and I multiply by how many I've got of each, I can know in total what their mass is as separate nucleons. So, there's the mass of a proton in atomic mass units. There's the mass of a neutron in atomic mass units. 40 of the protons, 53 of the neutrons. I just do the math on it, figure out those numbers, add them together, 93.75, da, 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 da. This is how heavy all of those protons and neutrons are when they are separate individual nucleons. So that's the number I'm going to stick in there. The mass of the nucleus is what we had on the previous slide. A little bit heavier, a little bit lighter. Subtract the two numbers, and I get this, the mass in atomic mass units. Now here's the crazy thing. Um, if this is all I was being asked for, I, I can be done here. This, this is it. But I've shifted it into kilograms. Why? because of what I'm going to do on the next slide. And to do this, what you have to do is set up a ratio for yourself. You have to say, I know one atomic mass unit is about 1.66 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. Set that up as a ratio so you can convert this into kilograms. And if you've got it, use the value for um, what an atomic mass unit is in kilograms with the extra digits. That's what I did. I didn't use the, uh, the value from my data sheet to do this. I used the more exact number that I had a couple of slides back for you. So I set up my ratio and I converted atomic mass units into kilograms so I can do the binding energy. Because the binding energy which we can call EB or delta E, is the mass defect times the speed of light squared. But because this is, let's call it a standard formula in physics, my mass does have to be in kilograms. 
So that's why I wrote out the big long number here in kilograms times the speed of light squared, and I get this. 1.29-ish times 10 to the negative 10 joules. Now again, if they're asking for an answer in joules, I'm done. I'm good. But there's a quirk here. Because if we're going to use non-metric non units, we might as well use them a whole bunch. We don't usually like doing little tiny numbers of joules in joules. We'd rather have electron volts. So I set up a ratio and I convert my answer in joules into electron volts. And then I notice something. Even though this was a tiny number in joules, 10 to the 8, this is kind of a big number in electron volts. Well, that sucks because we want electron volts to be normalish looking numbers. Well, that's where it gets even wackier. Because in nuclear physics stuff, what we often find is instead of giving answers in just electron volts, we give them in mega electron volts. So what I've done here is I took the decimal and I moved it one, two spots over because that takes me from ten to the uh, sorry ten to the eight to ten to the six, ten to the eight, ten to the seven, ten to the six, and ten to the six is mega. So if I cut off some of this just to write it a little bit normally looking, the binding energy that I'm dealing with here is eight hundred and nine mega electron volts. That's the way you'll usually see this answer written. So we do have to be able to go through potentially some conversions to get to there. Hope you can uh, maybe have a chance to look through some questions and try yourself out with uh, doing some of these calculations yourself. Good luck with that.